it, Zippy. You sit on a throne of lies. I thought I was done talking about folk history and holidays, at least for a little while. But then my boys asked me to make a video about where Santa Claus comes from. They're at the age where they find history a bit more interesting. Not as interesting as Minecraft, but still interesting. Now, I have two other videos, older videos, on Christmas that I will link in the description. One is on the history of Christmas presents. The other is on the story of the song Silent Night. This topic, though, is on the age-old question, where does Santa Claus come from? It's actually a harder question for people to find out on their own. Some of you may be aware that there was a bishop in the 4th century named St. Nicholas, but it's unclear how he got reindeer and started breaking into your houses to deliver presents. Some are even suspicious of Santa, thinking he's some sort of secular plot to remove the true meaning of Christmas from the nativity. I've had at least one educated man tell me, to my face, that Santa is just the name for Satan scrambled up to hide the devilish origins. Well, there's a lot of good information out there on the history of Santa, but it's not easily accessible. At least there is nothing immediately available in this kind of format. There are scholars of all stripes, religious and secular, who have pieced together much of this story that I'm about to tell you. But if you've watched some of my recent videos, especially on Halloween, you're already probably prepared for what I'm about to tell you. Santa and Christmas are Catholic traditions that get altered, changed, and secularized by Protestants after the Reformation. There is almost no connection to the Roman practice of Saturnalia or to the god Odin, though you'll often hear those claims in pop culture. Credentialed historians are agreed on that point, by the way, though a Google search or Wikipedia can make it sound like the jury's still out. Neither the Romans nor the Norse had anything that approached the idea of Christmas or Santa, though now, of course, the number of things said to be originally part of Saturnalia is comically large and mostly historically false. In fact, as you'll see in a minute, most of what we consider to be quintessentially Christmas and quintessentially part of who Santa is was invented in the 1800s, and the legend and the image of Santa didn't even get fixed until the 1930s. Santa Claus and Christmas, in other words, are new traditions riding on the coattails of older Catholic liturgy. Okay, first, St. Nicholas. We can count on the fingers of one hand what we know about the origins of St. Nicholas. We know he was Greek and from a wealthy family. We know he was Bishop of Myra in modern-day Turkey. He was persecuted under Diocletian just prior to the rise of Constantine, and he may have attended the Council of Nicaea, where the Nicene Creed got its first draft. That's it. At least, that's all we know for sure. Even the Catholic Church only formally recognizes these facts as provable for St. Nicholas. And so much of what we consider to be the fuller story of Nicholas comes from the legends and stories written down at a later time. My, my favorite is the legend that states that as an infant, Nicholas refused to breastfeed on Wednesdays and Fridays, since those are Catholic fast days. I'm, I'm sure that's how babies work. But he was certainly famous. We know this because in the area around where he was a bishop, people began to name themselves after him when they were ordained. Stories abound also of St. Nicholas caring for children and giving his wealth away lavishly, which is absolutely where the later stories of him as a giver of gifts to children originates. But he did not go around on December 24th giving gifts to celebrate the birth of Jesus. The most popular legend is that Nicholas once heard of three young girls whose father was old and poor and unable to pay for their dowry to marry. He was on the verge of selling them into, let's just say, a certain kind of slavery that I won't say out loud. Nicholas, the story goes, decided to act and he came to the window of the home at night and on three consecutive nights dropped a bag of gold into the window to pay the girls' dowries. Now, there's lots of little permutations of that story that go far and wide, but the basics are all kind of there. He gives lavishly, and he does so anonymously, and he is looking out for younger people in need. Now, there is, of course, another legend of St. Nicholas, one that is loved by theology nerds everywhere, and that is the story of St. Nick slapping Arius at the Council of Nicaea. <laughs> I think it's just the juxtaposition that makes people laugh. 
bearded old Santa Claus slapping a heretic for denying the divinity of Christ. Well, the story is unverifiable, I'm sorry to say. It really is only written down later in the Middle Ages. It is interesting, though, and it may have been true. This is actually a rare story because it tells a negative story about a popular saint, which does give it some measure of veracity. And no, by the way, this was not how business was conducted at councils. The later story is that Nicholas did this, he slapped Arius, and that he was defrocked and removed from his bishop's seat as a result. So we really don't know what to make of the story at all. Maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. But, well, the memes are going to live on no matter what. So that's not much to base Santa on. But then something happens in the 11th century. Just on the eve of the Crusades, the bones of St. Nicholas were stolen by a band of Italian merchants and removed to the southern city of Bari in Italy. To this day, in fact, his bones are on display there in the tomb in the Basilica of St. Nicholas. Now, for my money, that's the funnier story. You can go see the bones of Santa Claus in a church in southern Italy. Maybe don't bring the kids. <laughs> but that translation, as we call it, of the bones from modern-day Turkey to Italy brought a new veneration for the stories of St. Nicholas to Europe. And so the story in the West began to grow. Now, it's important to say there is an equally important expansion of the story of St. Nicholas into the regions that will one day be Russia, but I can't go into that. But the Russian Orthodox Church has a long-standing history of veneration of St. Nick, but that veneration does not produce the same story of Santa Claus as we know it today in the West. In Europe, though, two things happen. First, the Feast of the Nativity, that is to say, the commemoration of the birth of Jesus, was established in the early church to fall on December 25th. As I always say, no, they did not think that he was born on that day. No one did, at least in the ancient church. There was an older practice of Saturnalia, as I've already said, that was basically just a bunch of wild parties during the winter solstice, and they were largely over the top and, frankly, as Roman parties tend to be, kind of wild. To use Southern American lingo, it was the last barbecue cookouts before it got too cold and too dark to do much of anything outside until spring. That's really what Saturnalia was at its core. The other thing about Saturnalia is it was a time of kind of upheaving the traditions, the standards, and it was a time of what we would call misrule. And that idea of misrule and partying is what sticks around in European Christmas. So keep that in mind, and I'll come back to it in a minute. But the Feast of the Nativity had nothing to do with giving presents or Christmas trees or St. Nick or any of these things that we call Christmas today. Rather, it was December 6th, the Feast of St. Nicholas himself, that was the day for presents. Those stories of St. Nick giving gifts and being a bishop, weighing your sins and your virtues, was mostly what was in focus on December 6th. It was essentially a childlike version of penance. It was said that he would bring a sack of presents around to those who had been good. But he also, and this is also funny, carried a switch for those who had been naughty. And that is, of course, the origins a bit of Santa's list. You can just see the frazzled mothers of bad kids warning them that Santa is going to whip you when he comes to town. And you thought Elf on the Shelf was manipulative. <laughs> but don't mistake the story. It was more of a playful penance, a liturgical catechizing of kids into the practice of weighing your sins and good deeds in this act of penance on December 6th. In other words, what we consider Santa and Christmas was actually a story that was celebrated on St. Nicholas's Day, December 6th, and the practice was largely, again, a Catholic practice. December 25th, though, was mostly a large season of parties for adults, with a lot of drinking and eating, but nothing of what we consider modern-day Christmas, trees, presents, and jolly old St. Nick. So what happens? Well, quickly, the story is, is that the Protestant Reformation disrupts a lot of this historic liturgy, and that's across the board. New Protestant nations, Lutherans, Reformed, Anglican, etc., after the 16th century, worked very hard to figure out what to keep and what to throw away from the Catholic liturgy. 
Most of it got purged, even in historically liturgical churches like the Anglicans. So as a result, most Protestant nations found themselves wanting to keep primarily only Easter and Christmas, since those were celebrated in the ancient church and focused on Christ himself and not on the life of a saint. Protestants to this day still celebrate Christmas and Easter, usually. What happened, though, is that people still liked the giving of presents. They missed December 6th, to put it mildly. And so what happened in Protestant nations is you see a kind of creativity, if you want to use that word, and trying to come up with ways to keep the giving of presents without keeping St. Nicholas's Day on December 6th. In Lutheran Germany, for example, they liked the idea of the giving of gifts to kids, but again, they got rid of St. Nick, and they decided instead to have baby Jesus be the one to bring the gifts to the kids. They referred to this as the Christkindl, or the Christ child, and he stood in place of Santa, which is where the name Chris Kringle comes from. I always wondered that as a kid myself. His name is Santa. Why is he being called Chris Kringle? But it's actually a morphing of the word Christkindl, which is just baby Jesus bringing the presents instead of St. Nick. In England, a different tradition arose during and long after the Reformation, centered around the figure of Father Christmas. Not Santa, though the resemblance is certainly there for some, but more the embodiment of the Christmas spirit itself, or the merry season. Father Christmas wore green, and he had a long beard, and he sort of presided over the month of December as a reminder to laugh, eat, and drink to celebrate the season, as well as to be generous to those around you. For a long portion of English history during and after the Tudors, therefore, there is no mention of St. Nicholas or Catholic tradition at least not from the royal family or the Anglican Church. Instead, the Christmas season was stretched over the entire month, culminating not only in December 25th, but eventually in Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, on into the new year. Now, Boxing Day is that same move that Protestants do, where they change liturgy into a Protestant practice. The day after Christmas was originally the Feast of St. Stephen. Now it's Boxing Day and non-liturgical. Until the 1800s, in fact, England largely considered this Christmas tide season as a whole. Father Christmas was sometimes be mentioned, sometimes not. There was no Santa Claus or Saint Nick. A great example of this, by the way, is the famous song, Good King Wenceslas, written in the 19th century that tells the story of a Lord giving to the poor and being generous with the Christmas spirit during the Christmas time. It's not Santa, it's about the generosity of spirit. The other feature of the English Christmas season in history is that it was a notoriously large party season. Remember what I said about Saturnalia and the time of misrule? Well, that does live on in English heritage. It was often a wild time, to say the least. In fact, one of the things you often hear is that Puritans, or sometimes the royal family, were anti-Christmas at times. Well, this is why. It wasn't that they didn't like the remembrance of the birth of Jesus. Christmas was, in England, a lot like Mardi Gras in America, let's put it that way. Which, ironically, is also a Catholic holiday that has turned into a bit of drunken debauchery. But that's another video. But those are the extreme stories, the time of misrule, the partying, the drunkenness during the English Christmas. At its best, English Christmas is known for the best of its parties, its food, and its focus on merrymaking throughout the country. But the focus is on Christmas spirit in general. More on that in a minute. The third and last one that I'll talk about is in the Netherlands. There, St. Nicholas is not only carried on after the Reformation, but the story of St. Nick is expanded and continues even to this day. And that link is important. For the Dutch, Nicholas is known as Sinterklaas, which is, of course, the origin of the phrase Santa Claus as you and I know it. He has several of the features that would later become Santa, but it's not quite as clear as you think it is. You see, in the Netherlands, during the time of the Renaissance and a little bit after, it was said that Santa Claus lived in Spain throughout the year preparing gifts. Now, Spain at the time owned the Netherlands, and so the connection there was very obvious to them. He was back at the homeland making gifts, and he came once a year, again on December 6th, to check if the children had been good. 
and Cinder Claus had an adopted orphan boy named Peter, who was a Moor from that time in Spanish history before the Reconquista removed the Moorish presence as much as possible from Spain. Cinder Claus rode on a carriage drawn by horses, and he would, depending on the story, deposit gifts in wooden shoes in the windows, or young Pete himself would shimmy down the chimney to deliver the presents to the kids. Now, this Dutch tradition, as you can tell, is the origins of a lot of what will become Santa Claus. But it's the same old tradition, only changed and altered just a bit. However, there are two things that we need to point out. In the original Dutch practice, Santa Claus remained a bishop, and he was there to see if the kids were naughty or nice. He is not a magical creature. He is still very much part of the clergy. But also, to this day, the practice of dressing up as Black Pete is <clears throat> deeply problematic. Another story told by the Dutch is that Black Peter, or Black Pete as he is called, merely has soot on his face from climbing up and down the chimneys. That's not true, though. Historically, he was Moorish. He was of African descent. This story actually originally was more like Robin Hood, and if you're my age, you'll remember the best version of Robin Hood, which is the Kevin Costner version, where a man from the Crusades has connected with a companion that is Moorish, and they travel together as allies. That was the original center Claus. Again, from the Renaissance, it was this idea that a wealthy person living in Spain with an orphan boy at his side would come and bestow benevolence upon the kids there in the Netherlands. Now, today, needless to say, there's a lot of controversy about it. So if you arrive at the 1800s, there really is no Santa Claus. The Dutch practice is, again, still largely Catholic, still focused on a man from Spain coming to weigh the good and the bad from kids. So where does Santa Claus come from? Well, the simple answer is he's invented in New York. St. Nick and Christmas presents and all of the lore, you might say, behind Santa Claus was invented almost entirely by a few men in New York in the 1800s. And I use the word invent purposefully, because while there are roots and hints of Santa Claus in Europe, as we've already seen, especially in the Netherlands, what happened in New York was, you might say, creating a folk history for the first time. The men involved were largely associated with the New York Historical Society. And if you remember your civics classes, New York was originally... New Amsterdam, that's right. There is a long memory there, you see, of certain older traditions from the old world that the wealthy elites in New York felt were ripe for developing a new tradition in America. The society had Dutch roots, and they began to hold annual dinners on December 6th, there's that date again, to recall the original story of Center Claus, now called St. Nick, minus the kid in blackface. And then, after some rumination on the themes of Christmas and St. Nick, two men in particular, though there are a few others, should be credited for starting the ball rolling on modern Christmas. Washington Irving and Clement Clark Moore. Irving, of course, is famous for the stories of Rip Van Winkle and the legend of Sleepy Hollow. But he was a famous writer in his day, and he loved, we should add, to make up things in his histories that were entirely fictional. He seems to like to blend fact and fiction with abandon. Irving created a lot of legendary ideas that we still associate with New York to this day. For example, he came up with the name Knickerbockers to describe the New Yorkers. And he was the first to call New York Gotham. Well, in his History of New York, Irving referenced St. Nick or Santa over two dozen times. In Irving's work, he is still a bishop. And for most of the men in society, they kept that traditional Dutch theme. Only for Irving, St. Nick was no longer the Punisher. He was a jolly old man who loved to spread joy through gifts, and he was also now living in the North Pole. Can't have him coming back and forth from Spain. He was a lot more magical, you might say. But the real explosion of popularity about Santa came shortly thereafter from Clement Moore in his poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas. Now, I will say here that there is some debate if Clement wrote the poem or if a man named Henry Livingston did. I won't go into that here, but there is a book that I've linked in the description of this video if you want to read more about it on Kindle. I'll keep referring to the author of Twas the Night Before Christmas as Clement, 
for convenience, though. But Clement was an independently wealthy man, also a part of this elite society, who taught Greek and other languages at General Theological Seminary. And he wrote this poem in the same tradition as Washington Irving and these other men who were discussing this folk story of St. Nick. The inspiration for his poem, it seems, was just simply his imagination. Clement, though, takes the tradition in an entirely new direction, and from this point on, Santa is becoming a real tradition in America. For one, St. Nick is no longer a clergy member. In fact, for Clement, he's not even human. <laughs> he's a fat elf. Most people don't realize that when they read the poem. He's described as a jolly old elf. He rides on a sleigh drawn by tiny reindeer who each have names. That is also an invention of Clement. There is no Rudolph yet. Rudolph is invented later in the 20th century by a father whose wife was dying of cancer. But the others are there. And no, these reindeer are not Norse in origin. In fact, until this poem, there is zero affiliation with Santa and reindeer in European history. So here in the early 1800s in America, we have the full origination of Santa Claus. Based, to be sure, on older traditions, but frankly, a new folk story created in the city of New York. Now, back overseas in Europe and England, the story has developed during this century as well. This was the Victorian era and Queen Victoria was the queen of doing things properly, and with a bit more, we might say, pomp and circumstance. Famously, the image of the royal family with a Christmas tree was famous, and suddenly Christmas trees became fashionable in England. And that picture caught the eye of Sarah Josepha Hale, who I mentioned in my video on Thanksgiving. And in the 1850s, she published that picture in the Goodies Lady book, and then added to that over the years all sorts of new traditions for decorating the home for Christmas. Now, it's the 1850s. We've not yet approached the wonders of exterior illumination, but it's coming. But, lo and behold, because of Queen Victoria's picture and the Goodies Lady book, the Christmas tree in the 1850s became part of the American tradition. Likewise, the stories of Santa Claus and his reindeer found their way back over to England and eventually supplanted Father Christmas there as part of now a quintessentially British Christmas. So you have kind of a cross-fertilization. Ideas are moving from England back to America for Christmas, and America sent Santa back to the motherland. So to put it very simplistically, England creates the deeper themes of the Christmas spirit of generosity, merriment, and the overall, you might say, aesthetic of Christmas that many Americans found appealing. And all of that without Santa. Just see Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol as a great example of this. Published only a decade or two after the New Yorkers started fiddling around with this idea of Santa Claus, Dickens' Christmas Carol is a story of a man, Scrooge, who has lost his sense of Christmas spirit and generosity. Visited by the spirit of Marley, who, by the way, vaguely is in the chains of purgatory or hell for his greed, though it's all given a very secular ring to it. And after Scrooge's visitation by the three ghosts of Christmas, he finally is brimming again with the joy of English generosity and the Christmas spirit. Notice, by the way, no Santa anywhere in sight. In America, though, the lore and the heritage of who Santa was began to grow. And over the rest of the 1800s, that tradition will go back to England and will become a part of British Christmas ever since. And finally, if you noticed, Twas the Night Before Christmas, as I said, describes Santa as an elf. And what happens over the 1800s is that Santa really has no set figure or look, you might say. He has no brand. He is tall sometimes, he is short, he's an elf, he's a human. He wears red, he wears green. It's kind of a cacophony of different ideas. But finally, in the 1930s, the iconic representation of Santa as we know it would not exist were it not for Coke and the work of Haddon Sunbloom. By the way, if you want to see a legendary career in graphic design and art, just go Google Sunbloom. He literally did everything for the course of his career. He put the Quaker Oats Man on the box, he created Aunt Jemima. He created all kinds of legendary brands. But he also gave Santa his final 
bona fide image. Sundblom gets rid of the fat elf imagery and instead makes him the jolly fat man with a white beard that we know and love. Rosy cheeks, twinkling eyes, sneaking in to eat a cookie, and leaving gifts under the tree, that newly invented Christmas tree that was now a regular part of the American home. This was all invented in the 1930s. In other words, Santa, as you and I know it, is not even 100 years old. But after Sunbloom, there's no going back. This is Santa, at least in the minds of most people who celebrate Christmas. (laughs) 